Hello, friends and neighbors. This is Jeff coming at you with Screw Tape Letters Chapter 21. Which, Chapter 21, if you were to center in on a theme, it would be the theme of the possessive pronoun. And we'll talk more about that as we get going. But before we get there, define ownership. What does it mean to own something? Now, we might think to ourselves, well, owning something means paying for it, being the legal possessor. You know, what's that old saying? You know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. To be able to do something with whatever we want with it without any sort of consequences for the actions that we are doing. These and other similar definitions might be doing it for us, but there's something else that we need to think about. For example, think about taxes, for example. If you own your home, do you own your home? To own a home, we might think, would be to have paid the finished price for it, to which we now have the deed. But the thing about it is, is we still have to pay taxes on it. You know, in other words, there's still something that we pay even though we own it. So again, ownership, to actually own something. And on some levels, based on what the item is, we might be able to truly own something. But in other ways, ownership is a bit of an illusion because we really don't own even some of the things that we think we own. And that's what this is. This chapter is, is about. It's about the idea of owning and the illusions of ownership and, and thinking that, you know, as screw tape will say here in a little bit, you know, to trick us into thinking that we are the leg, legal possessor of 24 hours in a day to do with whatever we would like to do with it. You know, I mean, it's it's... Again, it's illusion. It's so much illusion. It's a way to get us to think. It's a way to get us to uh, look at life and to be disappointed at life and to be angry at the things that happen to us in life because we don't get to do what we want to do because with our time or my time. Well, let's see what screw tape has to say. Screw tape will say this. Men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury. And the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. The more claims on life, therefore, that your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured and as a result, ill-tempered. He'll go on to say, It is the unexpected visitor when he looked forward to a quiet evening, or the friend's talkative wife turning up when he looked forward to a tete-a-tete with the friend, that throw him out of gear. Now he is not so uncharitable or slothful, that these small demands on his courtesy are in themselves too much for it, they anger him because he regards his time as his own and feels that it is being stolen. He'll go on to say, Let him have the feeling that he starts each day as the lawful possessor of 24 hours. Let him feel as a grievous tax that portion of his property, which he has to make over to his employers, and as a generous donation that further portion which he allows to religious duties. So again, it's the idea of how do we view time and do we view time as ours. We'll talk about other things later. But here at the beginning, the first use of the illusion of ownership is in the realm of time. Say that you have a day off from work. How do you view your day off? You know, I tend to view my days off with the kind of, I try to protect them as much as I can because of the various uh, things that I do. Uh, I need that time to recharge. You know, I spend a lot of my working, what you might call professional time, ministry time, uh, being around people, which I have no problem with. I love people. People are important. But I'm also a natural introvert, which means that the more that I spend around people, there comes a point where I just need to get away from people and recharge my own battery to be able to get around people. Again, it's not a knock against people. Again, I love people, but I need my solitude in order to be able to do what I do. And so when I have a day off, I really try to protect it just so I can recharge for a bit, to have to think uh, about some things as little as possible, just to have a day of rest. 
But sometimes it doesn't happen that way because life happens while you're busy making other plans and sometimes you just got to do things. How do I view it now? See, the ball now the ball is now in my court. Do I get angry about this? Do I get cranky? Do I start throwing things around and throwing a tantrum because someone is stealing my time? If I'm not careful, I'll be tempted to do so. Why? Because it was my time. I was looking forward to this time. And I won't have another day, free day, for maybe another week or so. That's how this can trick us into putting us into a mindset that is not healthy. Think about overtime, for example. You know, as someone once said, as the company grew over time, he was asked to stay late and work overtime more and more. You know, again, we only get 24 hours in a day in which to do everything that we need to do in that particular day. So depending on what life circumstances you are in, maybe you have a career, maybe you don't, maybe you have a family, maybe you don't, uh, maybe you're, you know, a wife or wife and children. You know, everything that you have in life needs your attention. And you got to figure out a way in order to budget the time which you have been given to be able to give to your work, to your spouse, to your children, to God, and to everything else in between. You know, so again, the idea of time and using time, we have to be able to determine what's more important, what's not as important. And what Jesus taught you know, a couple of places in Matthew, looking briefly, he taught it more than just these two places. But just to give an example, is that we got to be careful how we use time. And we have to be careful about what we serve. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 16, it says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Now this is great because what this is, is talking about a time in which Jesus and his disciples were trying to get away. They were just trying to get away uh, from the crowds for a bit. They just got done doing a whole bunch of ministry and now we're just looking for again that time to come together again to recharge to get ready for the next task but the crowds would not let them the crowds found them they stayed and they would not go away this is how come you can almost picture the disciples kind of you know putting their foot up and trying to kick them out the door so to speak tell them to go away oh so they, they can feed themselves you know um, but they're encroaching on our time, you know, and this turned into the wonderful account of Jesus feeding the multitude. But it centered around the whole idea of people are encroaching on our free time. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 and 15, it says, Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Again, here was just another time in passing in which, you know, they're going along and the children run up to Jesus and Jesus is spending time with the kids and the disciples are saying, wait, you know, Jesus is too important for this type of thing. And Jesus rebukes them, says, stop it, bring them here. So again, it's this idea of do we have the maturity to recognize that our time is not our own? Our time has been given to us to do the will of God. But that's still the longing temptation. This is my time. Thinking about you, think about your life. Again, we talked about like when you have a day off. Think about what, what about if you go on vacation? You know, if you're going on you've been playing in this vacation for for who knows how long and then either while you're on vacation or right before your vacation, something happens that could take that time away. That time for you or that time for you and your family. And to take that away, they take that away so that you have to focus on something else. How do we respond? Why do we respond that way? Because we thought that this time was ours. It's not ours. The time is God's. And we got to use it to the best of our ability. We have to be reminded that we do not own our time. You look at John chapter 5, for example. In John chapter 5, verses 16 through 17.
where it says, The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. This is the man that Jesus healed at the pool on the Sabbath day. And then it says, And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. We have to be reminded that the, our time is not our own. Jesus and the Sabbath day is an interesting theme in the life of Jesus. How many times can we read about in all four Gospels about Jesus being getting himself in trouble because he had the audacity to heal somebody on the Sabbath day? You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do any sort of medical work on the Sabbath day and all these things on and on and on and on and on. And Jesus would teach lessons on the Sabbath day about what the true purpose of the Sabbath day was for. Now, again, in order to get the point, we have to remember what was the point of the Sabbath day. The point of the Sabbath day was a day of rest. It was supposed to be a day off for everyone and everything. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Basically means, you know, it was don't work. Not you, not your animals, not your slaves, nobody, you know, everybody take the day off and rest. And you look at what Jesus said in John 5, and you also look at other times that Jesus had, again, had to deal with this concept of, of working on the Sabbath day or healing on the Sabbath day. And he would, tell, he would use various examples. One example would be, look, if you had an animal fall into a pit, you would save it. So don't begrudge me for healing somebody on the Sabbath day. Here he uses the point, my father is working until now, and I am also working. In other, in other words, God is still working on the Sabbath day. Jesus would also use the example of how priests would violate the Sabbath day so that they would continue to work. In other words, even on a Sabbath day, people were still offering sacrifices to God at the tabernacle or at the temple based on what period of time we were in. And the priests had to oversee that. In other words, there were allowances for continued work on the Sabbath day. Service to God, service to each other. And so that's the point that Jesus was making. This is not my time. This time is dedicated towards God. God is working. I am working. Today is the day with which we do the will of God. So we don't get to come to God and say, well, I don't want to do X because it's my time. It's not our time. It's God's time. Because that's the thing about ownership. As we talked about earlier, ownership is an illusion. And we have to make sure we don't fall into the trap. Screw tape will say, the man can neither make nor retain one moment of time. It all comes to him by pure gift. He might as well regard the sun and the moon as his chattels. He is also, in theory, committed to a total service of the enemy, and if the enemy appeared to him in bodily form and demanded that total service for even one day, he would not refuse. He would be greatly relieved if that one day involved nothing harder than listening to the conversation of a foolish woman, and he would be relieved almost to the pitch of disappointment if for one half hour in that day the enemy said, Now you may go and amuse yourself. Now, if he thinks about his assumption for a moment, even if he is bound to realize that he is actually in this situation every day, he'll go on to say, wrap a darkness about it, and in the center of that darkness, let his sense of ownership in time lie silent, uninspected, and operative. He'll continue, the sense of ownership in general is always to be encouraged. The humans are always putting up claims to ownership which sound equally funny in heaven and in hell and we must keep them doing so. Much of the modern resistance to chastity comes from men's belief that they own their bodies. Those vast and perilous estates pulsating with the energy that made the word worlds in which they find themselves without their consent and from which they are ejected at the pleasure of another. It is as if a royal child whom his father has placed for love's sake and titular command of some great province under the real rule of wise counselors should come to fancy he really owns the cities, the forest, and the corn in the same way he owns the bricks of the nursery floor. Someone once said, Ownership is an optical illusion that tricks us into believing that we are in control of what only God can give. 
you know, and again, that that's the whole basis of it. You know, what do we actually control? What is it that we actually are in command of? Not much. You know, and uh, you know, for another example, biblically speaking, is Exodus chapter nineteen, verse five. In Exodus chapter nineteen, verse five, you know, again, this is, you know, God appearing at uh, Mount Sinai. It says. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So who does it belong to? It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. As God told Israel, I'm choosing you, and I can do so because the entire world is mine. We talk about you know ownership is nine tenths of the law, or possession is nine tenths of the law. God controls all of it, and God keeps it spinning. And so again, it's it's this idea of control. We got to get off this bandwagon because it's not ours. A great example of this, and this might be a little dated. I shared this with the class, and and you know I got a couple of nods, but most people have never heard this before. But I remember um, dealing with people of like the, the, the era of the Great Depression, like that generation of, of people. And they had this saying that I used to hear like more when I was younger and, and more of that generation was around uh, than I do now, which I'm, I'm kind of glad. And, that, and that, figure of spe- that figure of speech is the God of my understanding. I don't need anything in this life except for a God of my understanding. And that's how they would phrase it, God of my understanding. And I used to think that's the problem. We want a God of our understanding. We might not even phrase it like that anymore, but in our head, we're tempted to think that's what we want, a God of my understanding. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is, is that God goes beyond all of our understanding. I don't understand God. I read about God a lot. I read the Bible a lot, but I don't understand God. I don't understand his level of forgiveness. I don't understand his level of love. I don't understand how he can continue to give us a chance again, a chance and a chance and a chance and a chance over and over and over and over and over over again. I don't understand that. But that's the thing is that God, by definition, must be mysterious. Because if God was something that we could put in a box... He wouldn't be worthy of worship. But you know, it's, it's, it's also interesting because this premise of a God of my understanding, that's one of the premises or the points or the themes of the book of Job in the Old Testament. You think about the book of Job. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to study the book of Job. The wrong way is to look at the first couple of chapters of Job and then to jump automatically to the end of the book of Job and, and to look at God's conversation with Job and then how it all panned out. Skipping everything in the middle. That's the wrong way to do it. The right way to study the book of Job is to look at the entire thing. Look at look at all the chapters and that and that horrible debate that takes place for the most of the book of Job. And that's important. We have to see that. Because the center of that discussion is this entire concept of the God of my understanding. You look at Job as a person, and he was deemed as the most righteous person in the East. Yet in a single day, he lost everything. Because Satan wanted to have this, lack of a better phrase, wager with God. Take everything away from Job, and Job will curse you to your face, Satan says. God says, okay, but you can't touch the man. So in a single day, Job loses everything. From his property, to his animals, to his children. He loses everything. He still gives glory to God. Another day comes along. Satan says, Man will say anything in order to save his own skin. Allow me to touch the man and he will curse you to your face. God says, fine, but you can't kill him. So on another day, Job loses his health. 
to the point that Joe believes he's dying. His wife begs him to curse God and die. In other words, commit suicide by God. You know, curse God to his face so that God will strike you dead. And so you won't be suffering anymore. And, you know, he's having boils all over himself. He's, he's sick. He can't eat. He can't sleep. He's in constant pain. And on and on and on. Then it happens. The, 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 three, the three friends show up. I sometimes call them the three amigos. I sometimes call them the three stooges. I sometimes call them the three idiots. But the three friends show up. And the best thing they ever did was to sit with Job for a week and say nothing. Not because when they start opening their mouth, they <sighs> say a bunch of foolish things they shouldn't have said. But because when they were there sitting with their friend, they showed a level of moral support. But it is when they start opening their mouths that they get themselves in trouble. Why? Because of the way they understood God. Their belief in God stated that God blesses the righteous and curses the wicked right now. In other words, not some sort of future judgment or that God's going to work it all out in the end or anything like this. But if you step out of line and you become a wicked person, God is going to deal with that situation right now. Now think about life. Is that how it works? No, we know that, but that's the way they understood it. So now think about from their eyes, they see this friend of theirs, who in the course of two days, you know, not that the days happened right one after the other, but in the course of a couple of days, Job has lost everything and is now on the point of death. So from the outside looking in, what does it look like? It looks like Job is the biggest sinner that have ever lived on the face of the earth because he went from being the most blessed person in the area to the most cursed play, uh, person in the area and everybody's trying to figure out why. Because they want a God of their understanding and now God's doing something that's not going on with their understanding. And so in their mind, Job is the villain. Job's like, wait a minute, I used to think like you did, but I haven't done anything to merit what I'm going through, so something is seriously wrong here. And being pushed and shoved from the outside in by these three friends, Job said some things that he shouldn't have said. You know, for example, how Job makes the statement in one of the chapters about how I could go into God's courtroom where God is the judge and God is the, uh, the prosecuting attorney, and I would still come out innocent. Really? Okay. You, you think so highly of yourself. You know, I mean, he. there were a few times in which the, the friends would push Job to the point of severing all ties with God because of their foolish arguments, but Job would always walk it back at the end. This is why God's discussion with Job at the end of the book is so powerful. You'll stand before me, I'll, ans I'll ask you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then here we go. Because Job and the friends had to come back to an understanding of God works beyond my understanding. Because my, the possessive pronoun of mine, has become my God. Screw tape will say this. We produce this sense of ownership not by pride but by confusion. We teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun, the finely graded differences that run from my booster, my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, and my country to my God. They can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of my boots, the my of ownership. Even in the nursery, a child can be taught to mean by my teddy bear, not the old imagined recipient of affection to whom it stands in the spatial relation, for that is what the enemy will teach them to me, if we are not careful, but the bear that I can pull to pieces if I like. And at the other end of the scale, we have taught men to say, my God, in a sense not really very different from my boots, meaning the God on whom I have a claim for my distinguished services and whom I exploit from the pulpit, the God I have done a corner in. And so the point, again, the point of it is, is that Job and the friends, they have all missed it. They all got elements of God wrong because they relied on the God of their understanding. But their understanding of God was wrong. God does not belong to us. We belong to God. 
And when we start throwing the word my around a lot, you know, I love this expression or this example that Screwtape uses. You know, hey, we, we, we like to throw the my around. You know, my boots, my dogs, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, my country to my God. It's all about mine. And in America right now, we are very a very self-centered culture where it's about mine, what I want, what I can do, what I can possess, what I can own. Whereas the true freedom of following God is to recognize that God does not belong to us. We belong to God. And we're better off that way. So that I may serve him, so that I may be his vessel, so that I may be his instrument, so that I can do his will. And I alleviate and get rid of the my life as quickly as possible. This life is not about me. It's about God. Because at the end of the day, we own nothing. At the end of the day, the only thing we ever get to keep is our relationship with God, if we have one. Screw table say this, and all the time the joke is that the word mine in its fully possessive sense cannot be uttered by a human being about anything. In the long run, either our father or the enemy will say mine of each thing that exists, especially of each man. They will find out in the end, never fear, to whom their time, their souls, and their bodies really belong. Certainly not to them, whatever happens. At present, the enemy says mine of everything on the pedantic, legalistic ground that he made it. Our father hopes in the end to say mine of all things on the more realistic and dynamic ground of conquest. The devil wants us to forget that at the end of the day, at our judgment, we will receive either a well-done, good and faithful servant or I never knew you from God. Because at the end of the day, it will not matter how much we owned on this earth. We don't get to keep it. Every possession that we have on this planet will be either thrown away, sold, or given to someone else. Or destroyed. We don't get to keep it. Since we don't get to keep it, since it's not eternal, what do we really own? Nothing. Except for our souls. And our souls are just there so that we can give our souls away, either to the devil or to God. It's based on how we use them, how we live, what we choose. And so if the devil can keep us twisted and keep getting us to run around thinking of the mine, the mine of ownership, the mine of what I think I deserve, the mine of what I think I have, then we will forget that we don't own God. God owns us. And if we do not allow God to work his will in our life and to be God's person on this planet and in this life, he won't know us. And if he doesn't know us, we'll be with the devil. Don't allow mine to drive us in this life. It's not worth it. It's too short. We don't get to keep it anyway. But instead, dedicate life to being God's servant, living God's life, fulfilling God's will. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, we want to be with God. But the only way we'll be able to be with God is we recognize God's the one who owns, not us. Grace and peace to you all. We'll talk to you next time.